Good evening. I'm Keith Fox, CEO of Fiden, and welcome to an evening with great women painters. In 2016, one of my editors approached me with an idea of a book called Great Women Artist. Her reasoning was that despite rep women representing 50% of the population, women represent only 5% of the works in major museums in the US and Europe. Here's another fact, another startling fact. You can boo on this one too. Of the top 25 contemporary auction records, only three are held by women. Yayo Kasama, Cecily Brown, and Dana Schutz. They're all in great women painters. Georg Baslitz infamously said, women don't paint very well. So tonight we're here to prove him wrong. Fiden's Great Women Painters features 300 artists from 60 countries spanning 400 years. It started with over 3,000 artists that we curated down through nominators and our editorial team to get to the 300. Four of these brilliant painters are with us tonight, made possible with the support from Caring and its Woman in Motion initiative. Please join me in welcome Madeline Grishstein, Pritzker Director of MC Chicago since 2008, along with four painters and artists I am proud to call friends and collaborators. Jordan Castile, Hilary Petches, Loie Hollowell, and Genesis Twemain. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Hi, welcome to the MCA tonight. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Keith, for that introduction and for choosing the MCA uh, at the location and the beneficiary of your largesse. So we are so, so appreciative of you and Fiden. And thank you all very, very much for being here tonight. It's great to see you. Um, it is still early days post COVID and every time we gather these days, I, I, get, a, I get feelings. It's really nice. So thank you for being here. Uh, this event would not be possible without the generous support of Caring, which in 2015 launched Women in Motion, a platform that contributes to changing the place of women and the recognition they receive in the arts and culture. Um, Caring's Women in Motion uh, project connects to the heart of our work, the MCA's uh, commitment to inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, in particular our Women Artists Initiative, which is a deep and sustained commitment by the museum to further equity across gender lines and to promote the work and the ideas of women identified artists. Among the many uh, stats that we can cite here at the MCA uh, very proudly is that since the start of the Women Artists Initiative in 2020, over half of our exhibition, over half of our acquisitions have been made by women identified artists. Comparatively speaking, 11% of acquisitions across US museums are by women artists. And the Women Artists Initiative is part of a multifaceted effort that we have had in place since 2015 and a commitment to be 50% women identified artists in all of our programs, exhibitions, and offerings versus 14% national average. So, yeah. We are a majority-led women museum. As part of this, tonight we are honored to have four great women painters. As uh, Keith mentioned, Jordan Castile, right to my immediate right, um, yeah, give it up for love. <laughs> give it up for Jordan. <laughs> give it up for Loie Hollowell to her immediate right. Give it up for Hillary Petches to her immediate right. <laughs> and to Genesis Tremaine. Ahead of this dialogue, we asked each of these amazing, amazing artists to select a single image to represent their practice. And so we'll open the evening to talk a bit about their work with that, starting with Jordan. So Jordan, let's start with painting. So a uh, painting is a medium that has been critiqued repeatedly over the years, and yet, despite the range of approaches that we can see in the work, uh, you are all deeply, deeply committed to painting. How did you come to painting, and what keeps you invested in painting? And this is one of your amazingly beautiful paintings. Yeah, so this is, 
a work that was made in this past year. And so I feel like it's a signifier of kind of where I am now, but it all started with being left alone in a corner with a box of pom-poms, basically. Um, I think that painting, as I often describe it, is a very vast and expansive practice that is about the way that we are approaching material and um, I think you can use a lot of materials. I didn't know I was painting as a five-year-old with pom-poms, but I think I was. I feel very strongly that I probably was. So I think I'd started there. I was thinking about color. I was thinking about things that brought me joy. I was thinking about the way something exists in space and how to share that with others. And that's how it started in essence. I know that's not the literal, like, when did I find a brush with paint on it, quite literally, um, but that was much later at Michael's. Um, and it worked out just fine. I think the thing that keeps me in it is the same feeling that I had as a five-year-old, that it was providing a sense of joy, a sense of peace, a sense of pride um, and centeredness around who I was and what I wanted to share. I am a, a hyper kind of caregiver by nature, and I love the sense of sharing what I am seeing with the world. So. As I continue to make work, I think the thing that keeps me sustained is the meditation process of it, um, of thinking about how a material is relating to itself and in a compositional space. So, yeah. You know, I, I, when I look at your paintings, I see that empathic quality. You know, I see the way that you render with care. Yeah. And I see the way that you make sure that they, the, your subjects, are kind of very comfortable in their own skin and look directly back out. And there's a connection there that I think is, is, uh, is really, speaks to your sense of holding them, which is, well, thank you. I mean, really, I'm sure no, I could, it's up there. I mean, it's very, thank you. Um, let me ask the same of Genesis. Genesis, so good to see you. We were at an event last night with Carrie Mae Weems and we were both fanning over Carrie Mae Weems earlier. Oh my God. Uh, again, painting is a medium that is, you know, uh, it has been here forever with us since the beginning of time. And yet, you know, um, you are all deep, even with all the problematics of what, you know, is painting dead, what constitutes painting, you are, you are also deeply, deeply invested in it. So how did you come to painting and what keeps you invested in it? Um, thank you for asking me that. Um, I, I, I don't know how I uh, came to, I don't know if I came to painting recently or when I was little or I, I go back and forth about my relationship with painting or when I was younger um, I used to like to draw a lot you know and I was really good at it and I learned that when you were good at things uh, they were put up on the wall <laughs> and I really liked that attention um, and I also learned that um, if I added color to my drawings um, um, uh, the rest of my family members sort of noticed the things, you know? I, the, the attention was something that I, I craved very young. And the, the, the drawing, the skill of drawing, got it. And my Nana taught me how to make uh, what we call putty, what you would call pigment of a sort, paint, perhaps. And then I got really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> And when you're good at something, you keep doing it, right? And I was also encouraged to do it, right? So that's why painting. It was a medium that I was encouraged through. Um, it was a medium that I was good at. That's why I kept doing it. Um, and then you, the second question, well, I'm sorry, was? Yeah, no, I think you're answering it? it. Like, okay. you know, why you're continuing to be invested in it. How oh, I, because I, I continue to be invested in it because of the constraints around it currently. Um, I love being a disruptor, and I love being able to do that through, you know, through this medium. Um, I love the freedom within it. Um, I love the challenges that I bear within it. Painting is really hard, the you know, physical means of painting. So I really like that. I think it uh, continues to push my woman, uh, yeah, and my journey, you know, as in spirit, truly. You know, one of the things that I love about your work, among many other things, is the way you walk this really amazing line between figuration and abstraction, and the way you move also within with media inside painting. And I'm, if you don't mind, I'd like to I'd like to point out that you list spiritual materials frequently as your media. Could you tell us a little bit about that? That's 
unusual and super interesting and I think an important part of why you're invested. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm a devotional painter um, and I, I said in prayer, uh, dear Lord, if, if I may uh, leave the classroom for a while and, and, and uh, be given time to paint and pray, I'll give your name glory. Um, and so a part of this is making sure that it's all covered uh, within a covenant that I made a while ago. And that includes like being honest about um, who's in the room with me, uh, who's in the birthing room with me. Um, I've never met a woman who's uh, birthed anything alone, but they do exist. Uh, and I, that, I, I love that because it makes me uh, clear that it's important to name all of the person and persons that are present uh, during my birthing cycles. So that's why I have to uh, name uh, Yeshua or Holy Spirit. Um, thank you so much for that. That's so beautiful. And you can already begin to see a thread between, you know, that's, that circles around honesty, that circles around, you know, being candid with oneself. And so, um, so then um, Hilary Petchus, um, same question, because it is a good one, you know. Um, so it's so, so good to see you. Thank you. Again, painting, you know, it had, has been, you know, painting keeps, people keep saying painting is dead, like, and it keeps coming back, and uh, repeatedly, and you are deeply committed to it. And again, how did you come to painting, and why are you still deep in that game? You know, I think like Genesis, when, when I was little, there were, I, the, in my family, my mom provided us with some really basic art materials like every parent probably does. And um, there was a PBS TV show that taught kids how to uh, draw like um, with um, perspective and, you know, like show movement and stuff like that. And so I really, um, I, my brother and my other sibling and I, we watched it all the time. It was called Commander Mark, which nobody seems to have ever heard of. But, um, and uh, so, and again, like I thought I was good at it, so I kept going for it. And, um, you know, as I got older and I was in school, I went in and out of painting. I worked in uh, collage for a little while and just really trying to figure out my voice. But the one thing that I always had in my back pocket was um, a painting practice. And um, it was just in case, like, whatever I was doing in the moment wasn't going to work out. I had this representational painting practice that um, sometimes I only made a couple paintings a year while I was doing whatever my main thing was. But I could always go back to it. And part of the exciting thing to me about painting is that it, even though it really is paint on a surface, like, there's, it's two-dimensional, there are limitations it always feels to me like there's like endless possibilities. Even if you're given the same you know, object to paint over and over, it will never be the same. And it's just always this practice of somehow um, trying to work through problems to get to the place that you want. And usually that never occurs. Like I never f end up with a finished painting the way I imagine it. And so there's this magic that happens with every single painting. And in the paintings that that doesn't happen, it's usually because I'm having to do something I don't want to do. And I, you know, I'm like, okay, we're just going to quickly make a painting. And those are the paintings I don't like, you know, but with every, with the paintings that I do want to make, there's always a, um, something that happens, occurs, there's errors that I have to work through that, um, end up making, there's something special, and for lack of a better word, it, there's like magic there. And I think that's what happens when I see a painting that, I, that is made by somebody else. When you feel that magic, if it's, you can tell that they're not, they have their thing, but there's all of these variables that are possible. And um, so I, um, I think that it just, you know, like there's, it's the magic that makes it, me keep going back. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is, it is you, each of you create these extraordinary, extraordinary worlds. You stand out among this group in the sense that um, your work is not figurative and, and, and yet highly representational. Uh, but the figure, the figure is absent and oftentimes take these landscapes are based in California. And yet when I see them, I see you looking at these. So the figure is absent, but you're looking at them. How, how, how do you pull that off? I can tell you're there. <laughs> well, you, know, you don't absent yourself. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you, oftentimes it's coming from a vantage point where there's like a trail or there's a presence um, there. So I think probably that's, that might be why, yeah. Um, and did I? Do we have a picture? Do we have a picture for, for Loie Hollowell? Yes, excellent. Loie, hello. <laughs> Same question. So, painting, how did you start and why are you still in it? Oh my gosh, how did I start? Um, so my dad is a painter. He taught painting at uh, UC Davis my whole life. He retired recently. Um, so. None of, the, none of my siblings are artists, but I'm, I'm the oldest, and I think I really wanted to impress him. So I got a little closet and all of his oil, some oil paints in my house, and I just started painting at a really young age. And um, I think that it's been a journey over the years to move away from his, his painting, which is a male painter. He painted my mom in the nude or in leotards often. So it was like a very kind of, uh, it was a search, a search for me to figure out who I wanted to be as an artist. So um, my gender, my femininity has always been at the forefront of my practice. And at first it was kind of like, to fight against him and to, and to like, I don't know, show that there was another way. And because all the painters I, had, I saw growing up were like Vermeer, Piero, Della Francesco, Rothko. Um, and so it's just been like a journey of like discovering my femaleness, my body through paint. And for me, my paintings come off the surface, so I'm like, I, I'm constrained within the rectangle, but I feel like slowly I'm like moving out into space. There may be some sculptures happening at some point, but I think that, um, you know, I see painting as this kind of like bas relief space as well as within the, the flat space of the rectangle. Wow, I'm so glad that you brought up how your paintings are actually reliefs because it's hard to tell in a slide. But I, I was at the Hirschhorn on Tuesday, the Hirschhorn Museum in Washington, D.C., and I saw one of your paintings. And it, it, when you look at it from the side, it has real three-dimensional bodily presence. It is so in this painting, the relief. belly, the belly yeah. is yeah. a cast, and it's actually the cast of my director, who's right over there, Ben Strauss Malcolm's wife, when she was three months pregnant, right. and now it's on the surface of the painting. So these things actually really pop out. They have a kind of low relief element, and, and I'm glad you brought that up too, because um, you were looking, you are investigating, you know, um, what it is like in femininity, but all, but you know, pregnancy is is a topic that you go into. With the body, the pregnant body, is a topic that you go into, which is unusual. The female body, the topic of birth, and can you talk about that too? Because that's really well, really brought, interesting. I, I have some other images. Yeah, if you could show this one, and then there might I don't know if the other one is next. There's a side view of the belly. Okay, so when I was let's see, in 2014, I had an abortion. This was like no one was talking about abortion. I had an abortion, like so many other women. Thank God, Planned Parenthood, thank you, thank you. Um, and it was such an emotional, like joyful experience, but also physically painful, that I had to make some paintings about it. And I was a figurative painter before this. So I was like looking at Birchfield and Agnes Pelton and Hilmoff Klimt and trying to like figure out how I could use abstraction to talk about my body. 
and, and make it not, not universal, but more open, more open. And um, so uh, these were the first little paintings that are about this size, that were about my vagina and my uterus. And from then on, I just have kept, I, I just, it's like the female body just is like ever giving of content. I mean, it's just constant. <laughs> and I've recently had kids, and uh, it's, I mean, I feel like I could make paintings about being pregnant and breastfeeding until I, you know, until I die. It's just like, it, I mean, your, your whole cellular structure changes after you're, you're pregnant and you give birth. So I don't know what, you know, whatever, menopause, that'll be a great experience to paint. <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk you about know? that later. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's move on to the next question. Um, this wonderful, amazing, amazing book, which, by the way, up there, you can buy autographed by these four incredible people. Um, so please do. This book is inspired by a celebrated essay from 1971 by the great feminist scholar Linda Nochlin. And she wrote an essay called, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? Right? Picking up on that moment where the Guerrilla Girls were kind of um, a parroting the kind of male wisdom that Georg Baselitz, for some reason, you know, is walking around with thinking that, you know, painting, women can't paint, right? Um, and um, on the contrary, her essay showed that women have been there the whole time and are flourishing. So going back in time to your early years, and looking over the history of women painting, who were the women painters who were North Stars for the younger you? And I'll start with Loie. Do we have the uh, etchings? These are dry points from uh, Louise Bourgeois. Mm -hmm. So I think she was the first person I discovered away apart from my dad, and I think that she was just like blew my mind because she both had daddy issues. She kept her hair long. Um, she, what else? It, she would make art at the kitchen table. She made those personages at the kitchen table with her kids. Um, and I think, you know, one of the questions at the end is what, do you, what is your advice for young artists? And it's drawing, 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 drawing. I think. The practice of drawing in whatever form that takes, etchings, drawing on your iPad, sketching in a notebook, even you know, writing is all a form of drawing. And I think that's, you know, these early insomnia drawings, I'm also an insomniac. So I really relate to these insomnia drawings she made later in life. And um, yeah, I just, I'm lost track, but I just love, I love her. Louise Bourgeois, extraordinary artist, lived an incredibly long and fruitful life, yeah. and uh, you know, surrealist, surrealist inflected, and um, also a fantastic writer, and painter, and drafts person, yeah. yeah, and all of, and, and great sculptor. So, like you, and on not the thought verge. of as a painter, but there was a great show at the Met recently of her mm -hmm. paintings. That's right. We were and, talking about it in the back room, also, um, just how. She just keeps being like reinvented. You know, you yeah. can plug her into anything new, and she's done it. And she, it, it, everything that, like, all these different bodies of work she had, are all feel so contemporary. Just really incredible. It's true. I think because her struggles are perennial, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's why we're also sitting here. Um, can I ask you, Hillary, the same question? So again, who uh, were your, your North Stars for your, the younger you? Oh, um, well, really quickly, I just want to say about that essay. Yeah. There was a quote in there. So I had to reread it because I read it in school a bazillion years ago, knew the basics of the essay, but really thought I should probably revisit it since I, I, we were going to be talking about it. And there was a quote in there that just felt so good. And it was talking about Mills. I don't know who he is, he, but he was in there, it says that usual can be what can easily be accepted as normal, and it's because it's what we're used to. But it, and so people think that's normal, when in fact it's not, because 
the usual is what the dominant, whoever that, the dominant ruling class is, is saying this is normal. And I think today there are so many cases where we are um, realizing that the usual is not normal. There's a lot of different normals out there that have just been like, you know, uh, oppressed or suppressed or whatever. And um, just last month in Chicago here was an amazing marathon experience, running marathon. And it was the first time they offered a non-binary category, which was like just, it's, um, you know, it's like history making. And um, it was very exciting and, um, and my sibling ran with me there and placed third in that category. And so they were like, you know, history making also, but there was a lot of backlash for it. And it was, it was hurtful, I think, for some people that experienced it. And I was like, but you know, that's just because that's what's usual. So I used, so that we were talking about it in relationship to this essay where usual doesn't mean normal. It will be normal someday, but right now we're just not used to it. And, um, and so I think that that's like, in you know the same thing with this with the book and with the essay in particular, and um, I I really loved that quote in there, and I need to remember that often. That usual isn't normal; it's just what we're used to. So, um, but back to these. These are I, I grew up in Northern California, and so two of the artists in this um, this group are Northern California artists. So there's Joan Brown on the um, bottom left here who um, was part of the, um, she was in the, in the Bay Area and part of the California funk and I didn't realize she wasn't as big as, of an artist as I thought she was because it just, I only knew of a handful of artists and, and she was one along with the other California funk artists like, um, like um, uh, Roy DeForest and uh, Arneson and, you know, and, and stuff. So anyway, she was really influential to me and I think um, along with some of the other artists here, there's two expressionist artists, um, Marianne van Verk, uh, Verfken and Gabriel Munter, and they all three of those artists really use line a lot. Like there's there's like an like an illustrative good line, a hard line that's in everything, and um, there's a simplification of color, and those things I was really drawn to. And then the fourth artist is um, Hung Lu who was the, um, I believe she was the head of the grad department of Mills um, in the Bay Area. And I had seen her work probably when I was about 19 at the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento. And it was just like drippy and painty and, um, and it also, it, this, this painting doesn't have that example, but it was like, there was this like heavy line. And I think that that's something that really spoke to me was just um, like not necessarily needing anything to be like photorealist or anything, just like getting it done, like showing me what you, the information that is important and then simplifying it. Yeah, like um, the speed of that line is really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to move on to a question for Genesis. Genesis, who made space for you and who mentored you as you developed as a painter? Who made space for me and who measured me? Who developed who you? Who developed as me. A, yeah, yeah. Who, as you developed as a painter. Sure. Who made, who made space for you? Who mentored you? Sure, sure. Thank you for asking me that. That's a good question. Um, 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 I come from a very, very, I have a lot of support um, behind and around me, to God be glory. I, I come from a very large family, but I was raised by a particular bunch, and they are a very odd uh, and peculiar and beautiful and unique and rich and dark black people. I mean, just um, black, 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 just. <laughs> You know, and so, and within that, um, that bosom, um, I was given um, um, unique teachers, and those teachers were my, you know, my grandmother and my mom and my cousins and my uncles and my aunties, and you know how aunties are, right? <laughs> and I uh, refer to them often as a black university. Um, that's who taught me, that's who gave me my stretch, that's who taught me to read. <laughs> Um, so uh, the reflection in, in this piece um, 
uh, aims to give um, physical grace um, and uh, the best heart that I can um, around um, uh, those folk. It's like an embodiment of your love for them. Yeah, and and those who uh, we're, we're we're all in reflection of of uh, family in some sort. Um, I think that uh, the maternal is um, the greatest blessing that the family receives, um, and I think that um, I think we had better highlight that and better take care of her, them, they. And um, yeah, I think we should honor that as often as we can. Yeah. Thank you for that, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, can we move to the last image? And I'd love to ask Jordan a question, the last image uh, here. Jordan, who is a woman painter whose work excites you today? Yeah, so this is gonna sound like a plug for a friend, and it sort of is, because <laughs> Heidi Hahn has a show up in New York City right now, and um, she was a contemporary of mine when we were in graduate school at Yale, and I remember, and still feel this way, I would enter her studio, and there was literal paint everywhere, on her clothing, on the chair that she would offer me to sit in, like. I had never seen someone work and love a material in the way that Heidi works and loves a material, that she builds these paintings over time. And as you enter her studio, if you are graced with that kind of like privilege, they change and they evolve and they hold that lineage. And I think that the way that she is thinking about particularly the, the female, the feminine, um, her relationship to body, to form, to color, to domestic, um, is very evident within her work. They kind of holds all that kind of divine her, they, them energy of just, I don't know, sometimes they're weighty because it is weighty out here. Um, we are all full of the weight of the world. And I look at this and it's beautiful and it's full. Um, her paintings really make me look and remind myself, remind me of like a fullness that painting can provide. Um, so yeah, she's somebody in this contemporary moment that I and have been thinking about for the past few years is every time I stand in front of my canvas and I feel like I can't anymore, Heidi's a person that I'm like, yes, I can, I do love this. <laughs> you know, her love, that this love can be evident um, and she does it every time, even if it's a struggle, because it is always a struggle. Her, it's it, Nicole, 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 I can't remember. Yes. Bouchen? Bouchen. Bouchen. And Lower East Side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She just right. switched to them, so. Yeah. Run, don't walk. Yeah, run. I think it's worth it if you're in New York. <laughs> so. I love how you remind us all, I love how all of you remind us that, you know, this is, this is magic making, hard work, personalizing the deepest parts of you and the deepest experiences of you. And this is, you know, this is painting. So I'd love to drop these images now and ask you, um, because there's, there's, a, there's a, a question inherent in this, in this very cover, right? This, this strike through right here. There's a question inherent in this, which is uh, asking the long-standing question of whether we are artists or whether we are women artists, asking the long-standing question of gender. So this strike through really poses that question up front, uh, which is, you know, how do you consider gender uh, in relation to yourself? Is gender an important part of your understanding of yourself as an artist? And um, um, can I start? Um, I'll just, I'll just pick on Hillary. I'll pick on Hillary. <laughs> Hillary, I'm picking on you. You know, that, it's a funny question. Sometimes I think it's important and sometimes I don't. And sometimes I think it, there's freedom in it and other times I f it feels like there's maybe like limiting or it has in the past at least. Um, but, you know, sometimes when I think of like, I just love color and, um, you know, and I love pattern and I love decoration. And these are things that to me, um, at least in the past have felt perhaps, you know, uh, feminine or um, less academic or, you know, things that, that I 
wouldn't have wanted to admit maybe when I was in graduate school. And now I feel quite liberated and, and I really embrace those things. There's, they're bright and they're decorative and they're, there's patterns and, um, and I feel like perhaps as a woman I can just do whatever I want. Um, and other days I feel limited and, um, you know, it, I feel limited by it. But um, the reality is that it's just when I'm not thinking about it, when I'm in flow or I'm just making what I, what I really want to paint, I don't think about it at all because it just feels uniquely me. So. Mm -hmm. And Loie? What do you think? Is gender an important part of your understanding of yourself as an artist? Are you an artist? Are you a woman artist? Is gender an important yeah, part? Yeah, I mean, well, back to the relationship with my father. Um, I always saw myself in opposition to that. I mean, I, I love him, but it's uh, being in a woman's body, being in the cycle of a woman's body. Um, we were just talking about this backstage. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it presents challenges and joys, and uh, that comes into the studio. I mean, some, some weeks I just need chocolate in the studio all the time, and that's just present, and everyone in the studio knows that. Um, but uh, my work, I, I want to make work for everyone, so you don't have to be a woman or female identifying to enjoy my work, but it comes from my, it comes from here. My work comes from here, mm -hmm. so. I, I mean, again, going back to the kind of low relief form, there's, there, is, there is an absolute material physicality to the work, not only in the way that it pops out, but also in its kind of rugged, rugged texture of how you, how you compose on the surface. That, so that, that swirling technique that yeah. I'll use a lot, I was thinking of pubic hair. That, that kind of came from pubic hair. And then I also, the, the stippling, I was also thinking of like how to hairify the canvas or hairify the texture. Oh, which brings um, me to people like Eva Hesse and you know. Yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's interesting. And Genesis for you, is that, is it important, is gender an important part of your understanding of yourself as an artist? <laughs> I think that um, being a woman is the absolute um, greatest gift that God has given me, truly. Um, I celebrate every single day that I am a black woman. I love being a woman. I paint because I'm a woman. I, I, I celebrate being a woman. It's, it's a strength, it's a joy. Um, it's, you know, paint, painting to, for me is very much, we were, talk, we were just talking about birthing. Uh, it's organic to my spirit, body, soul, rhythm, you know, inkwell, right? So uh, I win there. I personally think I'm a stronger being because I'm a woman. <laughs> so yes, I think that uh, <laughs> uh, I celebrate that. I brag about that. I brag about being a woman painter, truly. And I celebrate uh, my gender's presentation, right, as a woman painter today. Um, because I think it's very, very important. One of my favorite things about presenting as a woman painter is that I'm a part of this beautiful spectrum. <laughs> and Jordan, I know that was hard to follow. It's so... I, I know, I know, I'm sorry. I mean, I just follow all of this because <laughs> I think it's so interesting to hear and to be in space with other people who think in the same way or approach like other makers who are describing what it is to be in the studio and the cycles of the studio and to be proud and to be a woman and to feel that femininity and to feel the lineage and feel my ancestors and like be in that. But also it, it just like a lightning bolt like kind of struck me as you were speaking Genesis because I think I've also spent years really um, in fear of the box that society or particularly the art world, the kind of pressures that really stem from writing and the way that people write and contextualize our work. Um, it's often woman, black, all those things become almost like bad words because I, I often fear that they are 
they become a, a mirror or a limiting factor in what it is that I'm actually thinking about when I'm painting, which is the color and the form, and that there are other makers who might not be woman identifying who don't have that as a beginning statement to who they, why they make work or whatever it might be. It is, I am a black woman and I love that and I am not afraid of that. For years people didn't even think that I was a woman because my name was Jordan and I was painting black men and they didn't understand the, all the perceptions of what that meant. People would meet me for the first time and be like, oh, I was like, oh yeah, tell me more. You're like, why, why'd you think that then? Um, let's talk about it. Um, who can make what work and when, you know? So I think that's a moment that I was especially like, yeah, it's me. See me, I made these paintings. And um, so yeah, I think that it is a, a wavering spectrum of experiences. There are days that I'm like, yes, I am a black woman and, and there are days where I'm like, can y'all stop talking about, like, can we also talk about my paint? <laughs> it would be nice if we could just talk about my use of paint. So yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't always get there though. You know what's Who one thing? What when? Yeah, yeah. One thing that I think that is really interesting about most of the women that I know that are artists is that there's this like collective lifting that happens among friend groups or you know greater friend groups or whatever. And I I think that's I think that's some, a quality that it typically is like uniquely female. There doesn't seem to be as much of a race to the top. It doesn't need to be this like one person at the top, there's just this collective weaving of a wider web of like lifting up. And I do think that is something like that, you know, when you look historically at women's groups um, that has happened. And I think that happens in contemporary art circles as well. And I, I feel really lucky to be part of that. Last question for you guys. Um, lightning round, um, advice for a young artist looking at your work, wanting to be with you, join this incredible trajectory of women artists. Anyone can go. Well, I had talked about drawing before, and I, I mean that. I really think that if you just have a sketchbook with you or a piece of paper of any kind and you're just drawing anything you see or any feelings you have, you're gonna, if, you, if you're lost in some way, if you're lost in your practice or you're lost in any way, you're depressed, I mean, drawing will always ground you. For me, that's, I found that and I, I, I think that's true. I don't know if you guys feel the same way about drawing. I, I think that like the one thing that probably, sometimes it, you know, all of us, seem relatively young and it, it's it, it can sometimes seem like things happen very quickly but it was a long many many years it wasn't just the years in college and past that it was all the years leading up to that of like of like having some sort of artistic practice and to just constantly challenging yourself and moving forward and know that even like the smallest after you have a baby it's so hard to make work but just like, you know, little things, just keep adding up and eventually you'll have got somewhere. And I think that that's something that I, I was, I thought once I graduated from school, I would have a career and it, it took a lot longer than that. So just to keep working and, and you know, it will, if, if nothing else, you'll have a more full, um, you know, studio practice. I. I feel like I would say something very tangential to that and that I've always, in the times that I've taught, the thing that I was running around saying to all of them all the time was nothing happens without the work. And in many ways it was like staying focused that you have to kind of get the noise to quiet down, especially now. I, we were having a conversation at lunch earlier today about how social media is really playing this like very powerful role in being kind of a young artist and what we think or perceive as being success and how someone got there. It's all just like smoke and mirrors. And I think that if there's a way that you can kind of quiet the noise and really focus on the work and um, especially like quiet the market, like don't have, like don't worry about the market if you're in school, like please, like, you know, like it's like, like don't just make the work, make bad paintings, a lot of them. 
like a lot of bad work what, and figure out why you think it's bad, you know? Like why, why? And then figure out why you love something and do that cycle like 20,000 times. I'm still doing it, so. Yeah, yeah. paint every day, hit it every day. Hit it every daggone day. Work hard. If you mean it and you want it, work hard. Whatever it is, hit it. That's my advice. <laughs> work hard. Bravo. Yeah. yeah. Um, 1971, when Linda Nochlin, um, you know, wrote that essay, Why Are They No Great Women Artists? When books were coming out in the first wave of feminism in the early 70s, books like this, they were done um, as a defensive measure. And today it's and, and, and. Today it's like, I can be in this book, I can also be over here, and I can be over here. And that is because of the incredible, um, powerful work that you have done to be in the world in a complex fashion, in a layered fashion, and to say yes, you know, and, 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 and. So we thank you, times four, for this extraordinary conversation. We're grateful to you for the work that you put out in the world because it changes us. And do the work, yeah, keep doing it. And we thank you for being here this evening and we thank Caring and we thank Keith Fox at Fiden and we thank all of you for loving art because um, art changes the world. And um, thank you for being here. Have a great night. <laughs>